Mr. Speaker, the problem with the feminist movement isn't that they're, not, that they're saying the wrong things. It's that nobody's listening. We think that if we can prove in this debate that you harm the ability of the feminist movement to achieve its aims at home, then on the comparative, this isn't a world in which we want to live in. Because the comparative in this debate has been completely missed, right? And this is why Cambridge and Oxford are looking baffled. Because the problem in the Western liberal democracies at the moment is that feminist movements are small and peripheral as actors. That low numbers of women and even lower numbers of men self-identify as feminists. People in this room might self-identify as feminists, but that's because you're spending a Saturday evening listening to a history on the Greg of a speech in a national theatre, right? So on the comparative, these conflicts happen anyway. The feminist movements do not have the ability to stop these wars occurring. No conflict has ever looked unlikely until the feminists hopped on board and then their public support. No conflict was ever looking certain until the feminists said, we oppose this, and then they said, ah, we'll stop proclaiming that this is for women's rights. Therefore, this is important. Why is this necessarily important on the comparative? Because at their very best, at their very best, they are slightly less likely to go into these wars. Right? For all the reasons Ben told you about how people already proclaim that they're acting on the rights of women in terms of a sham proclamation, this doesn't occur. And at their worst and with their harms, you harm the perception of feminists at home. On our side, the conflict still happens, as it will already, uh, except Caitlin Moran and the Fawcett Society, or I don't know feminist organisations in other countries because that's kind of the point, right? That they're very peripheral organisations with very little international sway, and you get enormous harms to the feminist movement, which the, we think needed to be weighted in this debate, right? Opening opposition kind of talked about this, but they got the discursive changes wrong. Right, when they say that the Daily Mail, if they criticise this at all, are going to say that are they delinking feminism and the, the militarist state, right? Far more likely that they're going to say, if they report on this stance at all and it has any efficacy, the feminists are opposing helping women who are stoned and denied education. We think that is a statement that is likely to enormously damage the feminist movement, but not one we think should Only two pieces of extraneous rebuttal then, which are both giving that comparative responses directly to the extension. She says two things. Firstly, there is a harm when feminists support these conflicts in as much as you link gender in those conflicts. Notice, the armies will still go in and the states will still go in saying they are acting on behalf of women, and that's my POI, and that you get all of the harms Fergus talks about. That, like, Boko Haram, I'm going to go, well, I actually read in The Guardian that the feminists are behind me, so it's not for women. <laughs> yeah, all of those harms still. So, this is a nonsensical point. And this is also true of the view of feminists in the West, in terms of a comparative, you still think that feminists are supporting this movement, you still think that women are behind it, and therefore all of the harms they talk about fall. I just, just miss the comparative. Right, okay, sorry, I'm angry about this. So let's look at what's important in this debate, right? Because it might be old that closing off have been the first people to put in efficacy, but we think that in the way that this works in the comparative, it's really important. And thanks, Fergus, I'll make the point first. We think that it is incredibly unlikely, firstly, that the view that these feminist movements will take will change the stance of the governments. Firstly, these are numerically small organisations unable to sway votes, and unable to sway the kind of support that happens. Secondly, in terms of their voice, they are very peripheral. Where they are not peripheral is on women's issues. Obviously, if feminists come out with a particular position on an issue which is perceived by the general public to be one that is primarily about women, about abortion or something like this, they have a disproportionate effort. They're invited onto news programmes to discuss these. They're invited to write op-eds about what they think. In terms of a military intervention, very few people are going to say, what do the feminists think? How do I get the feminist votes on board here? So think it is incredibly unlikely that feminists are going to have any efficacy in changing these kind of things. Why is this important? Okay. And this is, this is key. We do not think, and we do not believe we should live in a world where a movement adopts a position, even if it is maybe principally correct, because the opening opposition said it wasn't, but even if it was principally correct, that has no impact on that issue and enormously harms your ability to make impacts on other issues. Right? Why is it the case that it will damage then the perception if we proved that, like, if we prove they have no efficacy, why then is this harm that we introduce so bad? Three reasons. These interventions where they occur are likely to have three factors to their name. Firstly, they're likely to have wide public support, or at least a simple majority of public support. Notice that where interventions don't have these public support, governments are unlikely to go to them, i.e. Syria in terms of the UK and others. Secondly, they're likely to be based on a serious grievance. Notice that we didn't believe that the actions taken by ISIS or the actions by Boko Haram were even enough to intervene in these areas. Therefore, it's likely that there are serious human rights abuses occurring in these areas. Thirdly, it is likely that there is strong support by the international community for this intervention. We are beyond the age where individual states can go in without the consensus of the international community. These three things will characterise these interventions. In opposing these interventions, therefore, what harms occur to the feminist movement? 
Firstly, on a general level, they are seen to be taking a peripheral view out of step with public opinion, our opinions on human rights, and the international community, and therefore further paint themselves as people that are the other type of people that are probably criticizing this war. Those on the far left, and those who are, uh, belong to pacifist movements, which often are able to mobilize large marches, but very, very bad at mobilizing large support, right? Particularly when the conflict is one of the three areas I described. Actually, a bell, I'll take you now. Right. Leaving aside that soft justifications on human rights tend to be tipping points on why we go to war, and as we told you, anti-war movements tend to be left-leaning and have strong feminist influence, don't we neuter the only group capable of criticising the conduct of that war, so even if you don't think we can go ben, to war, we can still get policy? Ben, you completely missed the point when you said that soft justifications on human rights are important. Absolutely. Those that are able to advocate on human rights are not broadly feminist organisations, but organisations like Amnesty that aren't adopting part of the kind of feminist ideology and aren't, perif aren't peripheral in that way. We think that those kind of organisations given that they're outside of this debate, are probably likely, for the reasons I gave you, to support this conflict and protect human rights. And therefore, feminism actively moves itself away from the kind of human rights tipping point you talk about when you oppose these conflicts, right? <laughs> So reasons this happens. Firstly, on a general level, you get public condemnation, but two specific harms when the feminist movement does this. Firstly, the idea of ethnic essentialism, that, that like the common perception of feminism, that these are white middle-class women talking about like photoshopping of, photoshopping of uh, videos or whatever, and not actually looking at the way in which women's lives and their experiences are felt. We think you further this when you say that feminists are very willing to campaign on maybe abortions right in Western liberal democracies, or maybe uh, like cosmetic issues like advertising, but when it comes to women who are stoned and denied education, they say we should be non-active. They say we should not act, and they oppose moves that help those groups. We think it makes it less likely, therefore, you get buy-in. And finally, we think in terms of self-interest, it is more likely that they perceive these groups as self-interested, that if there is large public support in the feminist movement, say, ah, but there are some discursive problems that might occur, or in the long term, this might not be a good idea. If this might be true in debate land, it doesn't play out as correct in the public sphere, where individuals say, actually, we believe in the justifications for this war, we believe they're going to be helped, and you are only looking after yourself by saying there are going to be these ethereal, discursive harms that we hear from these guys. Why is this important on the comparative? Because these harms make it less likely for these feminist organisations to be able to advocate for the kind of things we think are enormously important in closing opposition. Less likely to advocate in Western liberal de democracies for abortion rights, for gender pay gaps, for all the other things that they do so well. When they take a stance which means they are less able to fulfil their core function, a core function we think here on closing opposition is enormously important, then they shouldn't take that stance. Ladies and gentlemen, panel, we think that this may be a principled stance. We think that if this principled stance has no effect, and damages the ability of the feminist movement to realise change. It's not one it is worth publicly taking. The last time for Sheffield, very, very happy to oppose.